NATO members and partners are testing their cyber defense systems in a four-day exercise in Estonia. The teams from 38 nations will try to protect computers from attacks and simulate decision-making in critical situations. NATO says cyber defense has become more important since the invasion of Ukraine. Speed, strategy and skill. That's what matters in war games. Whether they take place on the ground in real-life forests or online, as they do in Locked Shields, the international cyber war exercise. Some 3,000 people from 38 countries are taking part, and most of them are online. The goal? To bring different nations, like-minded nations, together to develop capabilities and also to develop knowledge about each, each other and trust uh, towards each other. The participants here in blue are the victims of several large-scale cyber attacks. Those in green are the attacking team. The blues must defend their infrastructure, energy supply, financial industry and national borders. The stability of an entire nation, albeit a fictional one for the purposes of this exercise, is at stake. The scenario includes propaganda attacks too. It's what's called hybrid warfare where both the attackers and the attacked constantly look for new ways to attack or defend themselves. It's just like what's going on right now in Russia's war against Ukraine. Traditionally, militaries focus only their own systems. They need to be available to uh, direct the warfare effort, etc., etc. But at the same time, we see that uh, with uh, war in Ukraine, uh, the adversary is trying to destroy the electricity, civilian infrastructure. And so actually, what is under attack is everything. And that includes the media in a huge propaganda war. Right from the start, it was clear that the war in Ukraine was also being waged in the media, as this advert, produced by Ukraine, shows. It's about the so-called IT army blocking Russian propaganda and disinformation. It's a measure that other Baltic states have also taken on right after the war started. It's no accident that Lock Shields is coordinated from Tallinn in Estonia. That's where NATO's Cyber Defence Centre is located, a central office of the Western Military Alliance and its partners for digital security. The Estonian state had to defend itself against several serious cyber attacks back in 2007, and it's been taking the issue seriously ever since. Uh, well, uh, up to now it works pretty well. Estonia is con continuously under heavy attack uh, from uh, Russia and uh, other sources potentially, but we hardly notice it because our defences are, are very good. And that's how it should be for all NATO countries, if the Locked Shields organisers have anything to do with it. Now let's learn a bit more about cyber warf warfare rather, from Dmitry Alpierovich. He's a chairman of the Silverado, Silverado Policy Accelerator. It's a think tank in Washington, D.C. Welcome uh, to DW News. Dmitry, uh, to what extent does cyber warfare play a role in the war in Ukraine right now? It's really interesting because we're seeing the Russians use cyber warfare quite extensively in Ukraine, probably the most significant cyber attack we've ever had in history in the context of warfare was undertaken by the Russians in the first day of the war when they attacked actually not a Ukrainian system, but an American company called Viasat that provided satellite communication services to Ukraine. And it had an effect in combination with other techniques that the Russians were using to jam radio communications and the like to really blind the Ukrainians in those initial critical hours of the conflict and probably assisted the Russians in the dramatic success they've had in that first 48 hours in taking a big chunk of the country, particularly the south region, uh, where they made a lot of progress right away. And even uh, in Kiev, were able to get almost to the outskirts of Kiev. Then, of course, the Ukrainians fought back, um, uh, in part because of Starlink, this uh, satellite communication system from Elon Musk. They were able to reestablish communications and, and uh, turn the tide against the Russians. But what the Russians have not been able to do is really achieve any sort of strategic success after that. Despite the fact that they're launching all these attacks against Ukrainian networks, Ukrainians are quite resilient. They're bringing them back, back up quickly and are able to work around it. Now, um, which areas are affected the most, military or civilian infrastructure? 
Really both. Uh, the civilian infrastructure has been pummeled. Their energy sector, their financial sector, their media are under just constant assault in cyberspace uh, with these so-called wiper malware uh, capabilities where they destroy data on, on your machines with denial of service attacks, where they flood your websites and networks with traffic to overwhelm you. So that is ongoing. On the military side, they've been really focused on uh, gaining intelligence in cyberspace, uh, gaining access to sensitive military systems. A lot of Ukrainian systems are actually connected to the internet because they wanna have every soldier in their military uh, get intelligence in real time, be able to submit information on Russian troop movements and the like. And for that, you need access to the internet, you need access to these systems, but it also makes them more vulnerable for Russian penetration. Well, the public is hardly noticing this, right? Uh, that's right. I mean, the public uh, in Ukraine is certainly noticing it, but when you put it in the context of daily kinetic strikes, these missile strikes, this kamikaze drone strikes from Iran, going after critical infrastructure, going after civilian uh, buildings and, and causing numerous casualties, you, you hardly worry about your website being down for a few hours. So that is the context in which we have to look at it. It doesn't mean that cyber is ineffective overall in warfare. What it means is that the Russians have not been able to integrate cyber with their overall combined arms efforts, with their ground troop movements, with their artillery, with their airstrikes for maximum effect, because that's really how you achieve successes in cyber, not using it as a standalone tool, but using it in combination with all of your other capabilities. And they've just not had any success doing that, not just in cyberspace, but as we're seeing on the ground as well. Now, uh, uh, one thing I would like to raise with you, everybody is talking about AI these days. Uh, how big a role will artificial intelligence play in uh, this kind of warfare in the future? Well, I think AI is really going to change every aspect of our lives, and cyber is no exception. I think both on cyber offense and cyber defense, it's going to play a significant role. I think we're a number of years away from that. But uh, the way that you can think about AI is that it's gonna automate so many things that you currently do in cyberspace. From an attacker perspective, it may help, uh, help uh, attackers find vulnerabilities in our software that they can then exploit to launch many more attacks going forward. But on the other hand, it's a, always a cat and mouse game in cyberspace. So defense as well is gonna be able to use the same technologies to try to identify those vulnerabilities and close them up. Uh, so it's always gonna be a race, who's gonna get there first, who's gonna be faster. Thank you very much, cyber security analyst Dmitry Alperovich. Thanks a lot for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you.